The last time we met, we were talking about uh, sort of the political legacy of the New Deal, how that really changed things in America for people that had more or less been on the outside of the political arena looking in. Um, I referenced industrial workers. Uh, we were talking about women, uh, how women assumed a much more public role in the aftermath of the New Deal. Uh, talking about racial, ethnic, religious minorities that were brought into what can loosely be described as mainstream American life. Today, what I'd like to do is talk about the political legacy, or excuse me, the cultural legacy of um, both the New Deal and the Great Depression. I think what you're going to find here is that the culture of the New Deal uh, was a continuation of that consumer culture that we were talking about in the 1920s. Uh, it was driven by consumer spending. Um, a good example of that in the 20s would have been Babe Ruth. You see a continuation of that in the 1930s, but there's a really important twist that I need you to be mindful of. And the twist is the culture of the 1930s was very much reflective of the political and social climate at the time. Okay, And I think one of the things that you're going to find is that it doesn't matter what genre you're talking about, uh, really doesn't matter what context you're talking about. Franklin Roosevelt was the star of every show. Okay, you'll see more of what I mean by that in just a few minutes. Obviously, I can't take you through every um, genre of cultural expression in the New Deal era, so we're gonna we're we're, we're gonna cherry pick. We're gonna pick and choose which ones that we're gonna emphasize. And I want to start out with comic books. Okay, now. Comic books are important for a number of different reasons, but on the most basic of levels, you didn't need to be fluent in English. You didn't need to uh, read at a 12th grade level. Um, comic books are more or less picture books, and even the language that they're written is so simplistic that you, you don't even have to be a native-born English speaker to, to really get the gist of what the book is trying to say. Now, the comic book derived from the uh, comic strip and as I mentioned before, in the turn of the 20th century, newspapers begin to modernize and add various sections in order to sell additional copies. And one of the things that they began doing is adding in comic strips, which would probably be equivalent to one of our, um, maybe like a soap opera or something like that. In other words, if you want to find out what happens next in Little Orphan Annie, you would have to go buy another copy of the Dallas Morning News of the New York Times, of the San Francisco Chronicle. Okay, So anyway, um, like the radio in the 1920s, it was a useful way of selling advertisements and keeping your customers buying your newspaper. Okay, But over the course of time, what you began to see happen is the comic strip really began to merge into the comic book. And what you got were these fantasy tales uh, where you have good versus evil, right versus wrong, and I guess that could probably be seen most vividly in the Superman comics. Okay, now Superman is introduced in the late 1930s, and copies uh, of the um, DC comic uh, book uh, were going for as little as 10 cents. So not only did you not have to be a fluent English speaker to consume this aspect of culture. Um, it was cheap and pretty much readily affordable. It was a cheap amusement. Okay, But think about the context of Superman. Um, Superman is actually Clark Kent. Superman is Kent's our alter ego. And when Lex Luthor strikes, or the villain, uh, the police department, the, uh, the, the authorities in Gotham City, a.k.a. New York City, are either too weak or too corrupt to really do anything about it. And so therefore, it literally takes a Superman, he's got to go into the phone booth and change into his blue tights, uh, to remedy the situation. Okay, Does that sound like anything that we've talked about in here? Um, Franklin Roosevelt was seen sort of like the savior, the hero of the United States in 1932 and 1933 promising help is on the way. It's going to take a super effort from a super politician to remedy the situation because as it stands right now, the federal government's either too weak or uh, too incompetent to really do anything about the Great Depression. So you can see a reflection of the time. Batman is another good example. Now, like Superman, Batman uh, is an actual person. That would be Bruce Wayne. And Bruce Wayne is a millionaire turned vigilante. Okay. He fights crimes, but the people of um, 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 uh, Gotham City don't 
really know what to make of him, considering they don't know if he's a good guy or if he's a bad guy or really what kind of guy he is. But at any rate, um, there's a lot of times that 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 Batman kind of takes matters into his own hands and kind of really skirts, really pushes that issue of the law, okay? And once again, if you think about it, it's a reflection of the time. Remember back to 1937 when we were talking about the Supreme Court uh, packing crisis? Um, that was not exactly on the up and up from a legal standpoint, but Franklin Roosevelt um, claimed that he had the greater good in mind, the protecting of the New Deal from the Supreme Court. So again, you can see various reflections in, in comic books that were reflective of the Great Depression and the New Deal era. Right? The film was maybe the most important uh, cultural um, outlet of the 1930s. I really think of it as the golden age of film, truthfully. Before we get to the actual films, what I'd like you to understand about the movies um, in the 1930s is very different movie-going experience than what you and I would uh, kind of relate to today. You go to AMC or Cinemark, these great big huge um, complexes where sometimes the same show is showing simultaneously in three or four different theaters. You have these massive, massive uh, theaters. Um, and when I say theaters, I mean um, um, the entire theater, not just one or two uh, um, individual theaters but a massive complex of them. In the 1930s, these movie houses or palaces is really what they were, um, they showed more or less one film, and they showed it uh, again and again and again, but at the any rate, um, you had to go downtown to see it. And the reason that you had to go downtown is downtown theaters, places like Dallas, Detroit, New York, uh, Los Angeles, they had what was called first-run rights meaning that before you could show it in the suburbs or anywhere else, um, the downtown theaters would have first crack at it. So if you wanted to go see a really, uh, uh, a, a really mainstream popular um, film, you, you would have to go see it downtown before anything else. Well, what that's doing, everybody, is, is, is bringing all people of the community together and, and they're rubbing elbows, right? So this culture of collectivism that we were talking about with the CIO, uh, the idea that we're all in this together, uh, the culture of the Great Depression, uh, the movies really lent themselves to that concept, okay? Anyway, the, the, the films themselves, I'm, I'm only, only, I'm only going to give you three, but I think that you'll get what I'm trying to say by um, listening to these three. Okay, Duck Soup, released in 1933, was a comedy produced uh, by the Marx Brothers, who were comedians, and it's more or less political satire. Um, I kind of like to think of it as the Borat of its day, if you wanted a modern film to kind of compare it to. But um, it's poking fun at politicians and the way that they organize society and, you know, how something so simple and silly can kind of morph into something so... Um, serious and potentially tragic uh, in, in, a, in a few short turn of, uh, turns of events. Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, released in 1939, is another very good example. It stars Jimmy Stewart, uh, the same guy that uh, um, we were talking about in um, It's a Wonderful Life. You usually see that uh, playing on TV uh, around the holidays, but uh, Mr. Smith is this um, a uh, brand new senator who is completely naive in terms of the ways and the uh, the culture of Washington, and you know he 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 goes with the best intentions, and he has no idea how corrupt Washington is, and it's not like he has a, a lot of intentions of cleaning it up. But the final scene is this real heroic scene where he's been on his feet for over twelve hours, and he's filibustering, trying to promote the Boy Scouts of America, because at the same time the special interests have kind of circled their wagons. And they're competing with the Boy Scouts for a plot of land that will be given to developers for profit. So anyway, again, very reflective of the time when it comes to the happenings of the New Deal era. But my favorite film of this time period would be The Wizard of Oz in 1939. Okay? Now, my guess is most of you have seen that movie. And another guess I have is that when you saw that movie, you were probably pretty young. So you might have the impression that The Wizard of Oz is marketed to children. Certainly not the case, okay? You think about the main characters in that film. You've got Dorothy. Now, where's Dorothy from? She's from Kansas, the heartland. She's a farmer. 
Okay, now what happens to Dorothy? Well, her house is blown away in the twister. Okay, and who blows it away? The wicked witch of the West, right? Is there something that's going on in the West that um, might be kind of problematic for environmentalism or people, generally speaking, farmers, generally speaking? If you think back to the Dust Bowl, that's exactly what I was referring to, okay? So the Wicked Witch of the West is kind of a metaphor, the same way that Dorothy is the metaphor for the common man, the, the, the heartland of America. The Wicked Witch of the West is natural disasters. It's Mother Nature imposing her will on humankind, okay? Now, when the house falls and lands, it lands on somebody. It lands on the Wicked Witch of the East. Who's in the East? Well, bankers are in the East. And there's a lot of people in the 30s that believe that this Great Depression was ultimately caused by Wall Street greed. So the house of this Midwesterner plopping down on this evil banker or evil Easterner really um, is reflective of the times, the political attitudes of the times. Okay? But anyway, what Dorothy wants to do, the whole point of the movie is to her get home. Right? And so what the munchkins say is to follow the yellow brick road, and she does. She follows the yellow brick road with Toto, and she encounters, um, she, she encounters um, along the way three individuals that uh, also want something. Um, the first individual that she meets is Scarecrow, and what Scarecrow wants is a brain. Okay? Um, might Scarecrow be reflective of something or someone in American life? Well, think about it. He's a scarecrow, right? And if you remember back to our discussion of the populace, one of the things that the populace wanted was a political party because neither the Democrats nor the Republicans were really doing very much when it comes to addressing the plight that was the farmers. Scarecrow wants a brain. The farmers want a political party, okay? The next individual that they encounter would be Tin Man. And again, he's a Tin Man. Who might he be um, uh, representative of? Industrial workers. And what is it that Tin Man wants? He wants a heart, okay? Now, a heart would translate into a union for the industrial worker, considering you can't live without your heart, and industrial workers desperately wanted a union in the sense that if they all stuck together, their life could be considerably better off on the shop floor than if they had to bargain individually with their bosses. Lastly, my favorite would be the Cowardly Lion. Now you think about Lion, it's the king of the beast, right? But what Lion lacks in the movie is courage. He's got these sharp claws, he's got these powerful jaws, but he's afraid to use them. Lion is representative of politicians, okay? Um, the Lion is the politician that has the power and the capacity to really address this Great Depression, but is worried about it and is reluctant to do so. So anyway, all of these individuals are trying to make their way to the Emerald City to meet the wizard, right? Because the wizard is the great and powerful Oz, and he can fix each and every one of their problems. Now, I'm going to fast forward quite a ways um, to the end of the, the, the movie, where they actually meet the wizard. And at first, everybody's terribly, terribly frightened. Uh, there's steam coming out of his ears, and fire coming out of his mouth, and... That all changes when Toto, the dog, pulls back that curtain and you find this old man behind the curtain that's pulling the levers and spinning wheels and pushing buttons and you come to the realization that there really isn't any great powerful wizard in reality. There's just a guy, right? Reflective of anything? Franklin Roosevelt, right? I mean, Franklin Roosevelt was seen as this guy that was the great fixer, the guy that had an answer to every problem in American life. And the truth of the matter was, he wasn't. He had foreseen the Great Depression no more so than Herbert Hoover, but people looked at him like that, okay? And if you think about the movie, the wizard has a really simplistic um, solution for all of their problems, including Dorothy, right? Anyway, film was very really reflective of the culture of the, 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 the political culture, I mean, of the 1930s. As were sports, okay? Um, in 1932, Los Angeles was hosting the Summer Games, and um, as you might imagine, they, they really wanted to present themselves in a favorable light, but we're talking about the depths of the Great Depression. 
there was homeless people everywhere, there was blight everywhere, there was, you know, evidence of a depression everywhere. And what L.A. did is really polish that uh, Olympic Village to, to the point where it almost seemed like the depression had skipped over Los Angeles. Well, back in the Midwest, there were workers that really wanted to remind everybody, the United States included, that the Great Depression was wreaking havoc on the American working class. So what they did is they staged something called the 1932 Counter Olympics. They asked workers across the world not to go to L.A. to boycott the L.A. games and instead come to Chicago, where they would have a working class games. Okay, um, Now, this wasn't really big in terms of well-supported, but it is evidence that um, people are using culture, popular culture, mass culture, as a way to bring attention to the crisis. Now, like film, you get some of the most important sporting events in the history of American sport that occur in the 1930s, very reflective of the times, including an individual from Ohio named Jesse Owens. Now, Jesse Owens was a track and field star, and he was also the star of the 1936 games in um, Berlin. Now, Jesse Owens is an African-American man, okay? And that's important in and of itself, but who's running Nazi Germany in 1936? Adolf Hitler and his Aryan supremacy philosophy. So if you buy into Aryan supremacy, the supremacy of the German race, um, theoretically the Germans ought to clean up at the Olympics. They'd be winning gold after gold after gold. Well, it wasn't the Germans that were winning these track and field events. It was Jesse Owens, and not by a little, by a lot. I mean, this was absolutely humiliating for Adolf Hitler, considering, you know, Jesse Owens didn't break records. Jesse Owens obliterated records, okay? Now, if you're following along with me on that PowerPoint presentation uh, under the clip entitled Sports, at the top right corner of the page, you've got an image of Jesse Owens on the um, Olympic stand, and what he's doing is he's saluting the American flag as the national anthem plays. A little ironic, considering very sizable chunks of the country, African-American men and women weren't allowed to vote. In some instances, weren't allowed to even participate in mainstream American life to the tune of ordering at a restaurant. It's kind of ironic considering this is kind of being presented as America's triumph, democracy's triumph over German totalitarianism. Another good example to that end would be the example of Joe Lewis. Now, Lewis was a boxer, as I imagine many of you know. Um, and it's probably also important that you understand that he was an African-American boxer. Now, there had been one African-American heavyweight champion of the world before he came, and he was actually from Galveston, Texas, and uh, his name was Jack Johnson. But Jack Johnson really turned white America on, his, on its ear, primarily because he was very open about his dating of white women. Now, as you should know by now in this class, that was a huge racial taboo in American life at the time, um, African-American men being aggressive toward white um, um, females. Long story short, Jack Johnson is almost um, bribed into taking a fall. And um, in the aftermath of this, in the early, uh, early 20th century, white America pretty much freezes the belt. Um, and so no black fighter is really given an opportunity to do this, uh, to, to compete for the heavyweight championship, and it's not because there's a lack of talent. Joe Lewis is coming of age in the mid-1930s, and he's such a talented boxer that America knows that it's only a matter of time but before you have to give him a shot at the title. So they really kind of embraced him as the next up-and-coming great heavyweight champion. And along the way, he was scheduled to fight a German boxer by the name of Max Schmeling. Now, again, we are talking about Nazi Germany in the 1930s, and uh, Schmeling uh, was the great Nazi hope, the great Aryan hope, as far as people like Hitler were concerned. Now, Schmeling was well past his prime, but he said before the fight he had a uh, secret plan to defeat Joe Lewis, who was seen as this unstoppable force. Um, he didn't let the cat out of the bag, but the secret was when, when Joe jabbed with his left, he would lower his right uh, defensive arm, and it would open up the entire right side of his face. And that's essentially what, uh, what undid Joe Lewis in this uh, 1937 bout. Now, over the course of the next years, two things happen. One, Joe Lewis is, in fact, given a title shot, and he does defeat a guy by the name of James J. Braddock.
If that name sounds familiar to you, it's because uh, Russell Crowe uh, played the part of James Braddock in the uh, popular film, semi-recent film, um, Cinderella Man. But anyway, Joe Lewis refused to have himself called Champ. He, he, he would not allow anybody to call him Champ or Champion until he defeated Max Spelling in that rematch. You have to understand what Joe Lewis meant to the black community. For the black community, this was pride, hope, and, you know, fairness. I mean, in the ring, you could get a fair fight. I mean, the ring didn't care if you were black, white, or green. You had the ultimate form of democracy inside the ring. And so Lewis really felt that he had let down his people by uh, losing to Max Schmeling. July 1st, 1938, in front of more than 80,000 people at Yankee Stadium in the Bronx, uh, Joe Lewis defeated Max Schmeling in under a minute. Uh, they called the fight because Lewis had hit Schmeling so hard that it had dislodged several of his vertebrae uh, in his back. And just like Jesse Owens, um, Joe Lewis knocking out, um, knocking out Max Schmeling was synonymous with America knocking out Hitler. And all across the United States, in, in places like Detroit, where Lewis was from, Harlem, New York, Cleveland, Ohio, Chicago, Illinois, I mean, these really big black metropolises, um, there were celebrations in the street, not just black celebrations, white celebrations too. So Lewis represents this triumph of American democracy over German Nazism. Now I'm going to start to move a little bit quicker because we've got a lot to cover and not enough time to cover it. We also see music really taking on an important role in the 1930s. And you have individuals like uh, Woody Guthrie, later on Pete Seeger, and uh, their group called People's Music Incorporated that uh, would record um, folk songs. And they would talk about everything from strikes to the plight of the farmers to, you know, the, the, the idea of having to end your day with a rumbling stomach because you couldn't afford to eat. So music was very reflective of the time and really kind of took on this folk, uh, folk song, folk music uh, persona. Literature. Um, I'm hopeful that you have at least heard the name uh, John Steinbeck. He wrote very famous uh, books in the 1930s, um, one of which was called Mice and Men, and you may or may not have uh, read that in high school. But John Steinbeck's arguably most famous novel, released in 1939, was a piece called The Grapes of Wrath. And it's this harrowing story of this uh, migration out of Arkansas, out of um, Oklahoma, West Texas, to escape the Dust Bowl. And all of these, uh, they're called Okies, right? All these Okies and Arkies that are traveling along Route 66 are trying to make their way to um, uh, California because they hear that there are jobs in the agricultural industry. And it's just um, tragic story after tragic story after tragic story that really kind of describes the plight of the uh, of the farmers in particular, but the common man, generally speaking. Um, theater. There's all kinds of great plays that are released in the 1930s, and like music and like literature, they're very reflective of the times, including Clifford Odets's um, 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 Waiting for Lefty, uh, describes a taxicab strike in New York City and how all these guys have waited for Lefty, uh, this union organizer, to save them when, in fact, Lefty never really existed in the first place. Lefty is a metaphor for the spirit of collectivism, and we need to join together as brothers and sisters in this struggle for unionism and bring our employers to task. Public art. As you should know by now, the federal government was trying to stimulate the economy by spending money. And so one of the things that it did with the WPA was it rounded up uh, unemployed workers and put them to work uh, building roads and bridges and schools and airports and all of these things that had some broader use to the community at large. Now, unemployed workers are very, very important for a number of different reasons, but they're not the only group that is struggling during this period. You also have artists, you have writers, you have poets, you have um, sculptors, photographers, all these people that would be considered, I guess, artists that are also struggling, can't find work. And so to that end, one of the things that the government did uh, through the New Deal was produce something called the Federal Arts Project. Now what the Federal Arts Project basically was, was public art. It employed unemployed artists, sculptors, writers, uh, playwrights, 
photographers to go out there and capture the spirit of the American people, right? Um, if you go to a place like Detroit, uh, as a matter of fact, if you look carefully, I know it's kind of, kind of blurry, but you can see it uh, behind me. Um, it's an, a, a mural that appears on the side of the Detroit Institute of Art done by a Mexican artist named Diego Rivera. And it's entitled The Automotive Industry. And whereas some people look at uh, you know, factory work as disgusting and exploitative, Rivera said that there's beauty, great beauty, and it's poetry, it's poetry in motion. And so Rivera was one of several um, famous artists and, you know, relatively common artists, too, were employed that had the government uh, pay them money to go out there and provide not only art, but art to be consumed by the masses, okay? Um, the Federal Writers Project, uh, what this did was it paid um, unemployed teachers, professors, writers, journalists to do things like go into the South and interview people that had actually grown up as slaves. They, they were very young at the time of their servitude, but you know, if you go to the Smithsonian in Washington, you can actually listen to the voices of former slaves because they were recorded through some of these writing projects uh, through the Federal Writers Project, a government initiative to try to really do two things at once. Number one, put people to work to get them spending, and number two, Provide something tangible that everybody in the community, including historians like me and you, can use. Dorothy Lang, right? Now, now Dorothy Lang is the um, photographer that we were talking about just a little bit uh, in the beginning of this um, uh, discussion on the Great Depression. She had taken that image of the, those two little boys hanging on to their mother. Uh, the, the mother looks very concerned. She looks... Uh, a little elderly, and actually, she's she's not that old at all. Um, but anyway, Dorothy Lang was um, was employed by the government to go out there and and give us a photo history of the Great Depression, and more or less what she concentrated on was the plight of the American people. So again, if you're with me on that PowerPoint slide, if you're looking at that slide entitled Dorothy Lang. Those are four of her photographs that are chronicling things like bread lines, the guy standing in line at the bread line, uh, rural poverty or people taking a bath in some of these homeless encampments in the middle of the countryside. Okay. Let me end our discussion by saying this. One of the very most important parts of the New Deal's legacy is this cultural legacy. And to that end, what the New Deal in the 1930s is really doing is redefining something called American liberalism. Okay, now, Liberalism had been with us for quite a while. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt was a liberal, even though he was a Republican. Woodrow Wilson was a liberal. And the basic idea as it relates to liberalism before the 1930s is about providing protection. Providing protection for those individuals that cannot protect themselves. The New Deal redefine that in, in, in terms of it swapped out the word protection with security, okay? Providing security for those individuals that have a hard time securing life for themselves. So who are we talking about? Well, we're talking about racial and ethnic minorities. Does the New Deal do that? Well, maybe not as directly as some people might like, but yes, it does. Um, industrial workers, does the New Deal do that? Yes, in a lot of ways, including allowing workers to form unions. The elderly, the quote-unquote deserving poor, does it help secure or make life more secure for them? Well, yeah, the Social Security Act. Now keep in mind, the Social Security Act allowed people to retire at a reasonable age, uh, public-funded pension to look after themselves. But furthermore, it also guaranteed that if you fell down, you broke your neck, it, it didn't spell a death sentence. So in that respect, the Social Security Act is a really, really important example when it comes to making life more secure in the United States. Now, of course, like anything else, there are critics on the left, there are critics on the right, uh, felt that the New Deal had gone too far. Um, but the simple fact of the matter is, life in the United States in the aftermath of the Great Depression and the New Deal is never going to be the same from a political standpoint. It's never going to be the same in the sense that for the next more than 30 years, it's going to be the Democratic Party that's going to dominate American politics. It's going to be the majority party. Um, number two, I think this is probably even more telling. 
I think what the New Deal really does is it develops this notion that when you have a crisis, whether that's the economic crash or the crisis of civil rights or the crisis is uh, the emergence of the Cold War, the idea that we can be uh, nuked off the planet, we've got enough nuclear weapons to destroy the world several times over, it's going to be up to the federal government to really address that issue. So to that end, the legacy of the New Deal is about expanding government to provide that security, and that's going to stay with us for a long, long time, and to a very good extent, it's still with us to this day. Now, we're going to end our discussion of the, of the, of the New Deal there, but I think if you pay attention, especially to the next, uh, to the next lecture, you'll see that in, in a lot of ways, the New Deal will live on into well into the 1940s. For the, for the time being, let's move on and talk about the road to war in World War II.